Monsieur le ministre, euh, honorable membre du corps diplomatique qui sont parmi nous, of the diplomatic corps that are here, uh, distinguished uh, guests, Merci ladies and gentlemen, thank you nous. very much for. Um, je sais que nous avons aujourd'hui, we have with us uh, the Deputy High Commissioner for South Africa, and I wanted to say how delighted we are uh, that he is able to attend because, of course, South Africa will be hosting the Durban conference shortly, and having made such a huge success of the World Cup, I have no doubt they'll make a huge success of uh, hosting the conference. Uh, je m'appelle David Malone, et j'ai l'honneur de présider cette institution, uh, le CRDI. For more than 40 years, IDRC has been a key uh, component of Canada's aid program supporting research in developing countries to promote uh, growth and development. Uh, by working with researchers in those countries, we support practical long-term solutions to developing uh, development challenges uh, that bring choice to those making policy in those countries by presenting them with options. Our programming advances Canada's innovation and foreign policy agendas Using science, IDRC also builds critical bridges between countries, helping enhance Canada's reputation abroad. Today, we are presenting new activities which are in the family of uh, uh, large research projects, which are more and more numerous, which uh, are about adaptation to climate change. And this uh, at IDRC, this is uh, for humanity, uh, science for humanity. We are fully convinced. Uh, of bringing about the, the fact that best solutions are brought about by quality research projects. We have electronically with us, at least I hope we still do, uh, Dr. Lindiwe Sibanda uh, joining us uh, by video from Pretoria, South Africa. And on the podium, we're very honored to have with us Dr. Saeed uh, Onpanu, who is here from Benin, who has made the trip all the way from Benin uh, to be with us. And above all, I'm very pleased to recognize the Honorable Peter Kent, an old friend of this institution uh, and Canada's Minister of the Environment. Um, throughout his lifetime, um, earlier in the media, today in politics, uh, Minister Kent has been known as a Canadian who has always made a difference to other Canadians and others around the world whose um, challenges he was reporting on for so much of his life. We share his commitment at IDRC to helping solve complex global challenges, chief amongst these coping and adjusting to the impact of climate change in the developing world. Minister Kent, please, the podium is yours. <clears throat> Thank you, and, uh, and it's um, wonderful to be here. Bonjour à tous et à toutes, uh, uh, members of the Accord Diplomatique, uh, bienvenue. It's actually my first time, as we were speaking outside, this is my first time uh, here at headquarters of the IDRC, although we have had uh, over the years and in my previous uh, uh, political assignment at Foreign Affairs uh, considerable dealings. Um, it's good to see some familiar faces in the room as well, folks in who have we work together in different dimensions. Um, and as, um, as previewed, uh, uh, and I know that many of you know that in my uh, uh, previous life uh, as a journalist, uh, before my late life uh, career adventure in, uh, in politics and government, uh, I spent uh, many years as a foreign correspondent for uh, Canadian networks uh, and one American network. Uh, it was a work, it was a, a job that took me to many continents, including Africa, uh, which, where in a matter, as a matter of fact, uh, I met my, my wife. Um, uh, that and the other experiences gave me a first-hand appreciation of the um, <laughs> importance of international cooperation. <laughs> there are many creative people around the world uh, tackling their own challenges and coming up with innovative solutions. Nations like Canada and certainly 
organizations like the International Development Research Center are in a great position uh, to help this innovation. Um, and my congratulations to our two recipients uh, here today, Dr. Sabanda, Dr. Okunu. Um, it, it is this sort of partnering um, which, um, which indeed uh, makes Canadians proud. Um, again, my experience as a correspondent gave me um, an enduring belief in the way uh, well-targeted assistance can make a real difference in the lives of people. Money isn't a solution uh, definitely to all problems, but assistance that helps local solutions emerge, the kind of assistance that IDRC is known for, uh, offers a, um, a truly great return on investment. En terme clair, il s'agit d'un investissement. Clearly, this is an investment in the future of the most vulnerable countries and uh, this with the consequences of uh, climate change, an investment in the future of the world community. what we're talking about here, an investment in the future of all countries uh, that are most vulnerable in the impact of climate change, investment um, in the future of our global community. Today we're celebrating the success of seven strategic initiatives that IDRC has supported under the African Adaptation Research Centers Initiative. As part of Canada's commitment under the uh, Copenhagen Accord on Climate Change, uh, we allocated $10 million in fast start financing last year to the IDRC for support in Benin, Burkina Faso, Egypt, Ghana, Kenya, South Africa, and Tanzania. The work of the research centers supported by IDRC focuses on important areas like agriculture, uh, fisheries, and food security. As more fast start funding becomes available, um, we will allocate it to, to similar initiatives. In environmental circles, there's always an awful lot of talk, um, sometimes used loosely, sometimes with great sincerity, about sustainability. Uh, I want to speak for a moment about sustainability of a of a slightly different sort, Canada's commitment to help those emerging nations that are vulnerable to climate change. At a time when economic uncertainty is turning the focus of many people inward, uh, which is a common uh, response during difficult times, um, our government is determined and committed to maintain our financial support, to keep Canada's hand extended, to do our fair share, to honor our obligations to uh, fast start financing as part of signaling our strong support for more effective global action uh, to address climate change, to match the success of our sector by sector domestic climate change strategy um, with success on the international front. As you know, our first fast start financing contribution of $400 million was fully delivered in fiscal year 2010-11. Uh, it is now helping to fund a broad portfolio of uh, clean energy projects. The, the technical expertise to support them is contributing significantly to efforts to address deforestation and forest degradation in developing countries. And it's helping ways to ensure food security in a changing climate and supporting uh, adaptation actions and research in Haiti, uh, in Vietnam, and in several African countries. In about a week, uh, I'll be heading to one of the countries we've supported with our fast start financing, South Africa. The United Nations is organizing its annual uh, conference in Durban on climate change. The 17th uh, conference, uh, the Canadian government will actively participate in discussions. The United Nations, as uh, most of you know, is holding its annual uh, climate change conference, the 17th conference of the parties uh, in Durban uh, next week. Uh, the Government of Canada will be there to fully participate in the discussions. Um, and in my dialogue, uh, both here in Canada, uh, in the United States, and last month in a pre-COP meeting uh, uh, in Cape Town, uh, have been impressed by the, um, by the focus and the determination of our South African hosts uh, to ensure that we come together uh, once again and, and continue um, the momentum uh, uh, established at Copenhagen and, uh, and uh, in the, uh, the Cancun agreements a year ago in Mexico City. Now these proceedings at these conferences can sometimes uh, get somewhat intense. Uh, there are over 190 nations at the table, each with a different circumstance, um, many with different agenda. 
Among other things, we're expecting a vigorous debate in Durban about how best to achieve ambitious global action on climate change going forward based on the important agreements I mentioned uh, reached last year uh, in Cancun, Mexico. Canada, uh, ladies and gentlemen, remains focused on achieving a new, more effective climate change regime under which all major emitters, uh, e both developed countries and um, major emerging uh, developing countries, uh, make commitments. Uh, we can do better than the arrangements that are currently in place. The Cancun agreements show the way forward to truly effective global action to keep global warming to less than two degrees relative to uh, pre-industrial levels. Canada is working hard to achieve our target to uh, reduce Canada's uh, GHG emissions by 17 percent over 2005 levels, uh, and we're well on our way to achieving it through our domestic regulatory action. We've introduced new tailpipe emission regulations for cars and trucks. Um, we're refining regulations that will reduce uh, GHG emissions from coal-fired electrical generation facilities, uh, which will make our electricity even cleaner, and it is already one of the uh, cleanest electricity uh, sectors in the world. In addition to our domestic action, we work uh, con continentally and internationally on initiatives that complement our domestic action as well as round out our cooperation uh, through uh, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change. Uh, we've worked with the United States on vehicle emissions and other initiatives, uh, and we've worked as well with the United States uh, and Mexico. Um, Canada is working with a number of countries now, including the U.S., Mexico, Sweden, Bangladesh, and Ghana, uh, to lead a joint approach um, to another initiative um, to reduce short-lived climate forcers. Uh, it's a global initiative supported by the United Nations Environment Program. By reducing emissions of black carbon, uh, of ozone precursors, and other gases, uh, we can slow the onset of climate change to ease the adaptation burden, including the climate change impacts already taking place uh, in our Canadian Arctic and elsewhere, and we can gain other important local health uh, and environmental benefits. This important work is part of a comprehensive approach to dealing with climate change across all effective channels. In short, uh, I believe we've accomplished a great deal since we endorsed the Copenhagen Accord almost two years ago now, um, and the Cancun agreements uh, uh, give us additionally uh, detail on a roadmap uh, to follow. Of course, we still have a great more deal more to do to build uh, on the success of Cancun. Going forward, um, we'll continue to pursue an approach uh, to climate change that is best for Canada and Cl Canada's circumstances. However, this government will not define success only by what we accomplish for Canada or with our immediate neighbors. We will define success in a truly global context commitments by all major emitters to address climate change and effective support to developing countries to face the challenges uh, that it poses. Si nous assumons toute notre responsabilité dans la lutte contre le changement climatique, we will benefit in Canada and in African countries that are represented here today. In closing, just let me say that if we all share the responsibility for addressing climate change, we can all benefit from the solutions here in Canada and in the countries in Africa represented here today. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much, Minister. Minister. Les changements climatiques constitueront l'un des plus grands défis à relever au cours des prochaines décennies. Les pays en développement y sont tout particulièrement vulnérables car ils sont en général fortement tributaires du secteur primaire, c'est-à-dire d'activités reliées à l'exploitation des ressources naturelles comme l'agriculture, les terres et la foresterie qui réagissent énormément aux aléas du climat. Ce, ces pays ne 
ne seront probablement pas en mesure de bien s'y adapter, principalement en raison de leurs ressources financières, de leurs moyens technologiques limités et aussi de la faiblesse de leurs institutions dans certains cas. Et ce sont les pauvres qui, selon toute vraisemblance, en subiront les effets les plus infâmes. In Africa alone, the number of hungry people is expected to more than double because of the effects of uh, climate change. Without effective action, the well-being of the continent and its people is threatened. IDRC is positioned to co contribute to adaptation to climate change. In 2006, we were one of the early funders of African research institutions working in this area through the Climate Change Adaptation in Africa program. And we had a wonderful partner in that program. Uh, it was the United Kingdom's Department for International Development, which helped us uh, build research capacity and provided financial support to the centers. These centers are now active in 33 countries, so it's been uh, quite an intense uh, program. The African Adaptation Research Centers Initiative, uh, the subject that brings us together here this morning, actually builds on the legacy of that work. It focuses on some of the strongest and most promising institutions working on climate change in Africa. Several, uh, allow me to take a moment to actually acknowledge Ewan Wallace uh, of uh, the British High Commission here. He heads up its uh, Global Issues uh, group. And uh, Ewan, through you, we wanted to say how delighted we were to, to work with the British government and how grateful we were also to the British government for supporting financially so much of the work we were able to carry out in Africa. So many thanks to your colleagues uh, here and in London. Um, the centers we will be funding, thanks to the Canadian government building on the earlier program, and the support was championed by uh, Peter Kent, uh, are located, you've heard already, in Benin and South Africa, but also in Egypt, in Ghana, in Burkina Faso, in Kenya, and in Tanzania, in case you were wondering. Um, for the next three years, each center will look at the specific impacts of climate change. Au Burkina Faso, par exemple, des chercheurs de l'Institut international d'ingénierie de l'eau et de l'environnement sont en train de faire un travail de sécurité chez les agriculteurs du Sahel. De concert avec des agriculteurs des provinces de Yatenga et de Bam, des chercheurs vont s'inspirer des stratégies d'adaptation locale utilisées en agriculture pour assurer les agriculteurs in order to soften the impact uh, of the climate change in the, in the region. In the Greater Africa, floods and seasonal droughts are already undermining the economies and prosperity of countries. Uh, research led by the Sokonie, uh, I apologize for the bad pronunciation, University of Agriculture in Tanzania will help the understanding of climate-related impacts uh, on farming and water resources. By 2014, we're confident that the Government of Canada's fast start uh, financing for the centres will have helped the institutions involved uh, under AARC become leaders in the field of adaptation research. I hope I've given you a small sense of what AARC aims to achieve but more importantly, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, the first of the two project leaders with us today, most precariously so, uh, Dr. Dr. Lindiwe uh, Sibanda, who has been with us uh, by video conference uh, for some time now. She is the CEO of the Food, Agricultural, and Natural Resources Policy Analysis Network, uh, based in Pretoria, South Africa. Dr. Sibanda and her team are linking researchers and policymakers in Lesotho, Malawi, Swaziland, and South Africa to provide advice on how people can best ad adapt to climate change uh, in the area. 
Uh, Dr. Sibanda, welcome to you, and the microphone is now yours. Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, uh, President David Malone, and uh, good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure for us at FANPAN to share with you what we are going to be doing under this research program. We believe that uh, with the national adaptation programs of action that have been developed by most of our African countries, there is need for a scientific base to, to inform decision making at household level and indeed at national level so that a conducive policy environment can be availed for improving productivity. By looking at the national adaptation plans that have been developed by most of the African countries, we note that 90% of our countries have prioritized increased crop productivity by adopting appropriate technologies. The question to ask is, which are the appropriate technologies and which farmers are going to be growing these crops by year 2030 or 2050. We therefore saw it fit that we should undertake a scientific process which integrates the climatic analysis, the crop modeling scenarios, and the livelihood scenarios so that we are better placed to inform decision makers. We have engaged a local center of excellence, the University of Cape Town, which is going to be downscaling the climatic models and give us the predictions for year 2030 and 2050. We are going to use this climatic data to simulate production of uh, the basic staples for 2030 and 2050. And then we're going to run some analysis to try and uh, choose the appropriate adapt adaptation models that will allow production of these crops under the climate scenarios for 2030 and 2050. The cost of production is important, so we are going to work with IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, to help us analyze the costs and the benefits of adapting to climate change under the predicted scenarios of 2030 and 2050. What's most exciting for us is that we are then going to interface the data on production with the livelihood scenarios. We have collected livelihood information based on the assets in the rural um, districts of Lesotho, Swaziland, and Malawi. And there we are looking at assets at household level. How many people, what type of agriculture are they involved in? What assets do they have socially, the natural environment, the financial assets, the physical assets? And we've given a score to each of the households that we are going to be working with. We are going to interface the livelihood data with the productivity models. And at the end of the day, we want to be able to give some evidence in terms of what crops can we grow in this district what type of farmer can adopt the recommended technologies, and what investments should our governments be putting in place to either equip the farmers at household level with the appropriate assets for coping with the climate change, and also in terms of policy, what is the appropriate policy environment that our government has to put in place so that the smallholder farmers who are involved in agriculture today can better cope with the changing climate. We are excited because the research is bringing in a diversity of skills, both from the socioeconomic analysts, the climate experts, agriculturalists, and the policy analysts. And we are going to use this evidence through multi-stakeholder dialogues. We will convene at village level, at national level, and at global level. And we are going to be presenting some of this work at the forthcoming COP17 through a learning event at the Agriculture and Rural Development Day, where we've brought in farmers from Swaziland to give live testimonies on how they are grappling with the climate change and what coping mechanisms they are currently applying in preparation for the predicted climate for the future. Thank you very much.
Dr. Sibanda, thank you so much. You had the complete attention of everybody in the room, and it was wonderful that you gave us a clear sense of how the activities are going to roll out and how the research aims to be useful in practical ways. So farewell for now, but many, many thanks for being with us. Uh, J'aimerais maintenant uh, uh, présenter Monsieur Saïd. And now I would Saïd like to introduce uh, Mr. Saïd Koukounou, who is the executive director of the NGO for a development integrated and sustainable in Benin, and he did the trip to be with us today. His work is implied in the extension of the previous program of the IDRC with the help of the British government. It is therefore a privileged partner. And you have the microphone now, Mr. Houtou. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Honorable Thank you very much, Ministre Mr. Sub Chairman, Honorable Minister of the Environment of Canada. It is a great pleasure and an honor for me to share with you what we are doing within the framework of the financing that we have reserved for climate change. I can tell you that today the climate change is a reality in Benin, and you can see this can be seen by everybody throughout the country, whatever the sector of activity in which you are situated. For example, last year, to give you a concrete example, we had there was a flood which had implied 55 communes on 117 in Benin. You can imagine the extent of this flood. In the flood, and there was not such a flight during the last 50 years. We have lost thousands of hectares of uh, uh, land, uh, so 2 million of pounds of food. So you can see the impact that this represents uh, in terms of in, uh, food insecurity for people who are very vulnerable and who are trying to fight poverty. And another thing that we don't see often, it's a certain a number of activities which have been held in the last few years and which are geared mostly on the shifting of seasons so that today nobody in Benin can tell you when you have to sow the corn, the maize, which is the main cereal to have a better yield. We have a very bad repartition or distribution, I'm sorry, of the rain. We have an increase of drought periods which is perturbing the yields, the agricultural yields. So everybody is conscious of the fact that when we are talking of the cultural change, it is not only, uh, it all not only concerns other countries, foreigners, but everybody sees every day what is the real impact of climate change. So concerning this financing, we have tried to see what would be the real needs of the most vulnerable population in order uh, to to try to soften their suffering. We have oriented the activities toward the most general 2,000 of producers who are farmers and who are mostly affected living in the rural zone around 35 communes covered by the project. And one of the priority objectives C'est de voir aujourd'hui quelle est la pratique la plus adaptée pour s'adapter contre certaines dates. Tout le monde parle de l'adaptation, mais au niveau des petits producteurs, c'est très difficile. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche qui est un peu différente de l'approche classique. Nous avons mis en place une approche so we don't need anymore to do a popularization of the practices. The farmer is implied. He can see, in fact, directly in his fields what are the changing that are occurring. And therefore, the producer has his word to say he can improve the technology in order to adapt it to his own needs, to his Au final, on a une technologie qui est appropriée par tout le monde et qui est vulgarisée à travers les petits producteurs. Alors, 
cette, cette approche nous permet essentiellement de nous orienter vers ceux qui ont besoin d'assistance et ceux qui n'ont pas un pouvoir d'investissement dans des technologies vraiment à basse échelle et qui permettent d'être reproduits, qui peuvent être produits sur 0,5 hectares, 2 hectares, etc. L'un des impacts déjà que nous avons commencé par avoir au niveau du, du pays, c'est que tous les acquis que nous avons eus à travers le programme Adaptation au changement climatique en Afrique, ces acquis ont été reversés dans le plan d'action national pour l'adaptation au changement climatique à travers le premier projet prioritaire qui a été développé, notamment à travers la la mise en place d'un système de préalable à la météorologie, également l'intégration aujourd'hui de l'adaptation dans la planification du développement local. Vous savez que le Bénin est l'un des pays pilotes en matière de décentralisation en Afrique de l'Est. Donc, les communes sur les 77 communes, chaque commune a une autonomie d'organisation. Donc, c'est de voir aujourd'hui dans quelle mesure réellement tenir compte des besoins d'adaptation, des besoins de développement, des besoins d'adaptation sécurité alimentaire et de réduction de la pauvreté tout en faisant face aux risques climatiques liés et, et au développement. Et j'ai l'habitude de dire souvent qu'on ne peut pas aujourd'hui parler du développement sans parler de l'adaptation. Je vais vous donner un peu quelques caractéristiques. L'année dernière, en dehors des innovations, nous avons eu quelques communes qui ont eu à innover, à inaugurer pardon, des infrastructures, notamment des marchés et des maternités. Dans la zone du Nord, qui est une zone de tornade, après cette inauguration, on a observé trois, quatre semaines après une violente tornade qui est passée et qui a déclenché près de 115 des toitures. Alors que cette infrastructure a mis près de deux ans et demi, avec près de 80 millions de francs d'investissement pour être bâti. Alors qu'on aurait pu simplement tenir compte de la dimension réduction des risques liés au climat, installer des risques autour de ces infrastructures pour atténuer un peu les effets. Donc voilà un peu, euh, on aura M. le ministre, euh, M. le président du CRDI, ce que nous faisons, et je m'en voudrais de finir sans attirer votre attention, attirer l'attention de tout le monde aujourd'hui sur la nécessité d'intégrer l'adaptation au changement climatique dans tout ce que nous faisons, la nécessité d'orienter la recherche, action participative vers les besoins réels des communautés les plus vulnérables. Il ne s'agira plus de faire de la recherche conventionnelle et après euh, de faire du, de la vulgarisation à part, mais aujourd'hui de tenir compte réellement de ce que les communautés les plus vulnérables ont besoin pour aller de l'avant, pour assurer leur sécurité alimentaire et réduire un temps soit plus Assure your food security and reduce poverty. Thank you. Donc voilà, euh, nous aimons so, faire les choses rapidement au CRDI. Like Donc, to, uh, uh, merci à tous d'être venus nous rejoindre aujourd'hui. So uh, le ministre restera quelques minutes today. parmi nous. Merci beaucoup pour venir aujourd'hui. Le ministre va rester pour quelques minutes. Mais je suggère que nous allons aller et prendre quelques rafraîchements à côté et que nous pouvons parler avec l'autre sur ce sujet important. Above all, many thanks to Mr. Ongponu for being with us all the way from Benin and speaking so impressively just now, and Minister for making all of this possible. Thank you very much.